The very first session of the day focuses on production of EVs, be it private or commercial vehicles. To talk about this, our next panel, we have with us stalwarts from the field of EV manufacturing and the chief executive of the organization that is playing a catalytic role in the transition to new mobility. May I now invite on stage Mr. Balbir Singh Dhillan, head of Audi India, Mr. Diego Graffi, Managing Director and CEO of Piaggio Vehicles India, Mr. Girish Wag, Executive Director, Tata Motors, Ms. Sulaja Mothwani, Vice Chairperson, Kinetic Engineering, Dr. Anbalgan, the Chief Executive Officer of MIDC, and may I request Mr. Prashant Girbane, Director General, MCCI, to conduct this panel discussion. Welcome you all back to the Pune AFC's Day 2. This is the concluding day of Pune Alternate Fuel Conclave. As you're aware, as part of this conclave, we have an exhibition happening at Sinchan Nagar ground. That started on Saturday, the Gudi Padwa day. That was the India's largest exhibition that's running, Ex largest on the EV front or the alternate fuel front. We also had a rally on Sunday with 400 vehicles participating. That's India's largest alternate fuel vehicle rally. Yesterday, we had the inaugural where Honorable Chief Minister talked as well as other Council of Ministers. We had also heard many Council Generals yesterday and other industry leaders. Today, the topic of the discussion that's given is about EV production. This is about enhancing the EV production in India. What better panel can you have than the gentleman sitting here who represent best of the industry in the, in the country we also have with us the CEO of MIDC, the Maharashtra Industries Development Corporation, who actually is organizer of this program, promoter of this program. So what we're going to do is first request Dr. Anbalgan, the CEO of MIDC, to give his opening remarks. Then I'll come up with a couple of questions to each one of you, if that's OK. Uh, on your right, hopefully that works. Thank you, Prasad. Namaste. To begin with, uh, I would say there are like uh, three or four uh, points on which I will have my, uh, like I would say a brief remark. Uh, because we are all, we, people are like, there is no exposure and no like sensitivity required here. So straight away I am going to the state's electric vehicle policy 2021. Uh, one of the pioneer policy of the country and which also tries to have all the ecosystem, which try to capture all the ecosystem starting from the uh, manufacturing uh, client who is going to purchase the vehicle and also the support infra, I mean charging infra. And the target set for the policy is like close to like 25% of the public transport uh, to be on electric or maybe alternate fuel. Secondly, 15% uh, of the MSRTC buses also to be on that. And try to like see, even if you look at uh, the policy, at policy puts all the locations at the same pedestal. So be it in Mumbai, be it in Gachiroli or maybe Buldana, the investment criteria has been, uh, I would think, phenomenally reduced so as to qualify as a mega project. And the D plus zone benefits have been given even in Mumbai, Raigad or even in Pune. So with that, otherwise like Pune, Chakan, Telega, they are all come in like A category, but for like uh, electric vehicles and also for ESDM. So these, this particular facility has been extended. So having said that, even if you look at the performance of uh, this particular policy, of late I think we received close to five proposals uh, for electric vehicle manufacturing and uh, two proposals are already been sanctioned and they have all been allotted land where almost close to half a billion investment has come and another 7,000, 7,500 investment is already in the pipeline. Maybe in another two to three months these uh, projects also will land here. So this is another thing and parallelly with that there are a lot of startups there are a lot of startups we are uh, looking at. Typically, the state also runs a private equity fund for a uh, defense aerospace and a, like varied of social sectors. But we are also planning uh, to do one uh, private equity fund for all the sunrise sectors, where typically EV and ESDM also going to be included. So minimum like budget we are looking at 500 crore to begin with. 
So all the MSME, typically if we say, if we in an uh, internal combustion engine, you have like so many parts, maybe like 15,000, 20,000. The moment you come to an electrically operated vehicle, maybe it reduces by 10x or maybe 20x. So how to upscale them, how to skill them out? That is going to be a, like a major task before all of us, both the industry and of course the government and the skill development. So these things are also being looked at. Parallelly to go with uh, batteries also like, typically you look at uh, batteries, even the entire ecosystem, if you look at the overall volume of battery, if you look at 17% is accounted by far in uh, Maharashtra, 17%. So that way, looking at the auto um, component, like uh, more than 22%, even the export, productivity. So we have uh, all the majors here, both like domestic and overseas. With that ecosystem, I think uh, Maharashtra state has every chance to be a, like, a, a, I would say, leader for uh, EV, typically uh, manufacturing. because. You also look at uh, demand, size and, uh, demand side and supply side. Typically, supply side is one thing we are looking at, but demand side is also the government is looking at. So the state with more than uh, more cities in one, I would say one million plus, we all know that there are a lot of issues regarding the, uh, particularly inland cities, uh, having spent around four years with like pollution control board, inland cities, particularly in Maharashtra, we depended heavily on like southwest monsoon, typically after March, the, wind dispersion is literally zero. Except maybe after the 15th of May, the wind tries to, you get some wind. And that is more of a, like a pre-monsoon. The moment you get any pre-monsoon sever, the monsoon gets extended. So typically for Pune, Amravati, even Sholapur, these places are going to be a very tough, particularly in March. And we, can, we are seeing like the temperature rise. So where we, we do not have a luxury of like uh, maybe a Mumbai or maybe Tana where you have a coastal dispersal. So, where with 70% of the vehicle emissions typically from vehicle and also that demand is going to be there and government itself is pushing. To give a push for initial two to three years, you need a hand holding. So, the government is going to be biggest client for you. So, with that, uh, I think Maharashtra should take uh, lead in this particular sector. There are certain policy inputs which yesterday's uh, like deliberations have come in. The state is seriously looking at to tweak the policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anbalgan, for sharing the lie of land in Maharashtra in terms of preparedness for EV, as well as the policy and the execution of the policy from government of Maharashtra. That's really encouraging. Uh, we're well known as a leader in automotive industry. M many trends uh, we have followed, but we're very thankful to MIDC for actually wanting to lead this change and hence, among many other things, organizing this Pune Alternate Fuel Conclave so that we can lead these conversations rather than just follow them. Just a question to all in the audience before I come to the panel, with raise of hands if that's okay. How many of you actually own EV already? All right, thank you so much. Just trying to calculate the number. So that already is about 10% uh, among all of these, right? Good. The question that I want to check with all of you is, we all would want to hear, we read a lot about what's happening in EVs, the conference is going to talk about it, but all of you are the major manufacturers of EVs, uh, among other automotive, other parts of uh, vehicles, other kinds of vehicles. What exactly is the uh, state of production in India today? And Thereafter, we'll come to the point of where do you see it going in the near to medium term. So what we're going to do is we're just going to move counterclockwise from here. We'll take the views from the Tata Motors and then we'll end with the Kinetic Motors. So we'll start uh, with uh, Girish. So thank you, Prashant. And I think before coming to production, I'll speak about demand. Because I think demand, is, demand creation is more of a bottleneck than demand fulfillment. So on the demand creation, I think the government has already laid out a good amount of incentives, which we'll speak about later. Uh, talking about uh, the customers, generally they have three anxieties in their mind. First is range anxiety, then whether charging infrastructure will be available, and whether the vehicle will perform better, right? So I think this is getting addressed by the OEMs very well in terms of range, which is sufficient for intra-city usage. The charging infrastructure is coming up gradually in the country with, uh, with the intervention of the government. And I think most of the vehicles also now have 
both slow charging and fast charging. Slow charging can be done overnight in, in your residence also. So that gets addressed uh, one of the part. And the second thing is in terms of performance, uh, customers do have this doubt in their mind whether this vehicle is going to perform in terms of uh, the ICE or IC engine vehicle that they're using. And I think I'm glad to tell you that most of the EVs which are being introduced actually deliver better performance as compared to those of the IC engine vehicles. So I think this customer anxiety is getting addressed. This is one point which is very specific to commercial vehicles, which is about ownership cost parity, right? And whether an electric vehicle will cost the same as that of a diesel and then CNG. So the good thing is in buses today, already the electric buses have achieved a cost parity with respect to uh, diesel, diesel buses uh, with the with the own and operate model that the government has come out with. And in small commercial vehicles, which is meant for last mile distribution, I think one should see this uh, cost parity happening maybe in two, three years time. And it's only about the CNG, the gas, which is more, uh, uh, you know, lower cost as compared to diesel. We'll have to wait for two, three years more for that parity also to be achieved. So that's on the, on the customer side. I think on the demand fulfillment side, I would say that most of the when you talk about the cost parity, is it just the buying cost of it or the total cost of ownership of it? Sorry. It's, a, it's a very good question. So I think, you know, the buying cost parity or the purchasing cost parity is something which will still take time because the batteries are imported, right? But uh, the ownership cost or operating cost is much lower because of the lower electric cost. And when you put this together in the life cycle, you are able to achieve cost parity in terms of rupees per kilometer. Now, on the demand fulfillment side, uh, most of the aggregates, which is batteries, traction motors, and other aggregates are still being imported. And therefore, we are dependent on outside countries uh, in this regard. I think the government has now come up with a master stroke in terms of the auto PLI, right? The productivity link incentives, which is available for automotive OEMs in terms of auto PLI, which is equal to almost more than 25,000 crores of incentive. It's also available for auto components. 75 auto component makers have... Uh, applied and being sanctioned. And third is also, of course, for battery manufacturing. So I think the government is laying down all the roadmap for ensuring that the key aggregates are localized, with which I'm sure the demand fulfillment will also get addressed. In terms of penetration, which was part of your question, um, you know, I would speak about cars and commercial vehicles. So it, it appears that in cars, by 2030, the penetration should be upwards of 25%. In small commercial vehicles also, the penetration should be upwards of 25% by 2030. In buses, it will be more happening in intra-city operation, but still at an overall level, the penetration should be more than 20% by 2030. Great, thank you so much. I think those trends are very, very helpful. Uh, for all of us, some of us as consumers, but they're very helpful for also many MSMEs uh, that are part of the supply chain for the large OEMs. So thank you for giving that guidance. Uh, Diego, uh, we already aware, we saw in the expo uh, the vehicles that you have. Uh, many of us visited those. Uh, we can see some of those on the streets. Uh, so it will be great to hear from you. What is the state of affairs in terms of the production numbers, uh, to the extent that you can comment on that, uh, both for your organization as well as nationally, and where do you see it going from here? Okay. Thanks, Prashant, for, uh, for the question. Thanks for inviting me to this forum today. Okay. I try to contextualize uh, the point on uh, the world of three-wheeler. We know that the three-wheeler is uh, a segment, a sector uh, of the automotive that is meant for livelihood and entrepreneurship. It's not meant for commuting, it's meant for uh, doing business. That means that uh, the owner, typically the owner of three-wheeler are particularly sensitive as well as Girisho was also saying, related to commercial vehicle, particularly sensitive to cost of ownership. And by far, we can say that as of now, today already, the cost of ownership for a three-wheeler in an EV version, independent if it is fixed battery or battery swap, is by far the more convenient among all the possible powertrain solutions. So uh, what we have seen in the last uh, couple of years uh, is that the penetration of uh, electric into three-wheeler, I think, is the highest among all the automotive sector is already in the range between 7 to 8, 10% based on 
last uh, data come from, from, uh, from registration of, of new vehicles. But means that, uh, for sure, going forward, uh, at least my view is that in the next three to five years, thanks also to the uh, coming up of policies, both at central uh, government, state, and uh, also at local, uh, local level, will help definitely to take forward even the penetration. And I think that uh, giving a preview of 25, 30% of penetration within the next three to five years is absolutely not a dream. Uh, this is already a reality that we see. We don't have to push. It's customer itself that is asking for this kind of solution. Coming to the first part of your question, what is the status of production? Okay, I have to say that as far as concerned Piaggio, we have taken a call not to develop a specific platform for EV, but to use existing platform that have been proven to be quite successful in terms of payload and satisfying the customer needs. So the only specific part that we develop is related to the electric powertrain. And I have to say that that's how we are compliant to the threshold given by the scheme in terms of localization of components, still we have a lot of parts that are imported from out of India. And I think that as of now, as far as our experience is, but I share the same view with also some of my, my peer competitors, is I think it's the big, uh, big, biggest problem, the biggest strain that we can see as of now in terms of supply chain capacity to follow the increase of demand. Most probably, I have to say, nobody was expecting such a sudden increase of demand in such a short span of time. Uh, I have to say that the first preview that we have given to our suppliers, not uh, later than one and a half year ago, were less than one third of what we can see now in terms of demand potential. But means that uh, they also thanks to the PLI scheme that is coming up also for component manufacturer, my expectation, my hope is that uh, Due to this kind of intervention, uh, there will be more localization of component, more increase in terms of supply chain capacity. But at the moment, I see is the main constraint that we see for a further explosion of demand of three wheeler. Thank you so much. That's so encouraging to hear. Yes, I think the, the rules do not change in this conference that there is no penalty for clapping. Those who want to, they can clap. That's okay. I mean, it's all right. It doesn't harm, hurt anyone. So uh, thank you so much. I think it's very encouraging to hear uh, that in next three to five years, the kind of numbers that you'd see. We'll also welcome Honorable Minister. Uh, Honorable Minister, thank you so much. So uh, taking forward the questions, uh, we also have here uh, Audi India. So we would hear from you, Mr. Balbir Singh. Where do you see the numbers today? Has, while I know some of the answers for the audience, has already started producing, when would it start producing, what are the numbers like, and where do you see it, how do you see it progressing over the next three to five years? Uh, thank you, Prashant, for inviting. And uh, uh, as far as the luxury segment is concerned, I think we are still at a very, very start. Uh, we've launched five electric cars last year, and they're doing extremely well. In fact, I, uh, I'm happy to share that, you know, all the cars that we've been importing are already pre-sold before they arrive. So what is happening is we, in the beginning when we were planning to import the cars, um, uh, we were kind of skeptical what will be the acceptance of these cars in India. And in spite of the cars coming at the highest possible import duty, which is over 100%, uh, the cars are just flying off the shelf. That's how the demand has been. So demand for us has not been the problem. Of course, the supply is the challenge today, you know, the global situation. Uh, but the acceptability of electric mobility is really, really very fast. And I can tell you the segment that we belong to, you know, that we are selling electric cars over one crore, all of the cars that we are selling. It's not about, uh, most, most of our customers are well to do so. It's not about uh, the ownership and the cost of ownership. What is heartening to see is the young generation playing the role of buying electric cars. So, you know, we come across so many customers and we are speaking to them personally because we are just selling, starting to sell these cars. And I make sure that my team and I speak to these customers on a regular basis so that we also evolve. And the stories that we come across are amazing. Like one customer told me that his 14 year son almost forced him to buy an electric car. So, you know, these kind of stories which are coming through. So, the acceptability of the brands of electric cars is really very fast. 
coming back to the manufacturing i think it is still time we we represent let's say the luxury segment itself is just 1% of the overall car segment so we are tiny little segment that we represent and electric cars within that is also very tiny little but we continuously uh, evaluate and as and when we reach certain threshold limit where we see that the investment that we need to make are justified for let's say next 5 years of sales that is where we will jump in and i always say it is a matter it is not the question of if it is when uh, as audi globally we've already decided to become a fully electric car company by 2033 so it's it's a journey that we have to tread how fast we'll reach there our anticipation on our, on our own at this point in time is that about 15% of our own sales should be electric cars by 25 2025 2026 but that's purely as of now based on import let's say as and when we are able to start making these cars or assembling these cars locally it will only go up so i think we see this to be a very positive trend acceptability is good the central government especially the maharashtra government has been doing extremely good efforts and i mean we have our minister sitting with us he is so positive and promoting this on a day in and day out basis and this you will see the impact of this in our lives because when they come on the street and drive this car and you know promote these cars on a daily basis people see this and it just replicates so this is very heartening and i think uh, the adaptability of electric mobility will surprise us that's how it is so every day we are getting surprised with uh, new stories that are coming through thank you so much I hope uh, some of you have uh, visited the expo uh, because expo has those two vehicles that are not yet sold hopefully uh, those are the only two that i could see there uh, so please when you visit the expo do visit the stalls that uh, most of these companies have there another quick question before i come to sulajja just raise of hands how many of you visited expo all right the, for rest of you those who haven't yet you have this golden opportunity only till 8 pm today trust me thank you and you don't require any hashtag hash code anything to go inside this no password required no fees required so please do visit it so let's uh, you know within your firm as well as uh, outside beyond uh, as somebody who champions the cause of environment renewable energy and now the company that made luna also is making the evs so why don't you tell us about what's the state of production today in your firm and where do you see it how do you see it progressing from here uh, first of all a very good morning to all of you and i want to congratulate marana chamber of commerce for hosting this wonderful seminar the firoda family has been very closely associated with maratha chamber so very happy to see you taking the lead and i want to also thank the maharashtra governments especially our honorable minister aditya ji entire mrdc team for really being very supportive and promoting electrification in a very visionary way so i think we can look up forward to great success of electric vehicles in our state um now coming to uh, the question that you asked um uh, my colleagues have spoken about the bus sector the four wheeler sector partly the three wheeler sector as well so let me speak about the two sectors which our company represents uh, in kinetic group uh, we have been one of the pioneering companies in electric vehicle sector we set up a new company called kinetic green about 6 uh, years ago and we've been one of the early players in the ev sector when it was not so fashionable to be an ev company and now it is of course very fashionable and very uh, promising but we done a lot of ground work uh, we focus on light mobility so we began our journey with golf carts and electric three wheelers both passenger and cargo and now we have also entered the electric two wheeler sector uh, in 2021 so vehicles which are meant for the last mile or intra city transport small electric vehicles and um, uh, we have sold more than 60000 vehicles we have 500 dealers across the country um, so very much committed to this sector i'm also proud to say that uh, all our vehicles are frame compliant and we have achieved 100% localization in our vehicles so we don't rely on import every part in our three wheelers is made in india and along with kinetic green even our group companies have invested in ev technology so company which uh, makes ex, uh, transmissions and gearboxes in our group called kinetic engineering makes now transmissions and axles and gearboxes for evs for us as well as for the sector we make electric motors in our group we make controllers within our group companies who are experts in those areas and also working with the entire sector so we worked hard on localization by investing in the technology even at the subsystem level 
So it's been a very great, uh, rewarding journey and we're looking forward to a wonderful future ahead. Now coming to the two sectors, um, I'm very bullish on the prospects of electrification for three-wheelers and two-wheelers. Uh, Mr. Graffi spoke about his journey in three-wheelers and I would like to say that three-wheelers is really the lowest hanging fruit in electric vehicles uh, because the commercial uh, sector or the driver who buys the vehicle for uh, you know, earning his whatever daily salary or wages, pay daily earnings, finds that he gets a lot of saving when he uses electric vehicle because the per kilometer cost is just a fraction. So it's 40 pesa per kilometer vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, one, two and a half rupees for uh, uh, petrol or, you know, even higher, three and a half, four rupees for diesel. So he actually saves money every day and therefore takes home more money every day. Um, and all the three wheelers are mostly intra-city whether it is passenger or it is cargo for waste collection or uh, last mile delivery like e-commerce. Uh, so except for the rural sector, you know, where you have the larger diesel vehicles, uh, most of the vehicles are moving around in the city. So I believe that there is a very strong case for electrification. If you include e-rickshaws, which are selling in big numbers in our country, already 25% three-wheelers are electric. It's a very large number. And I believe that in the next 10 years, uh, I don't see why 75% of vehicles will not be electric. They will be, in fact, electric. Uh, we are in a phase now when customers are ready to adopt the vehicles. More uh, solutions have to come in the market. Uh, local supply chains have to gear up on capacity. But otherwise, in terms of adoption, this segment is going to have deep penetration on electric vehicles, both passenger as well as cargo. Uh, there's a lot of work happening on the policy side as well, which needs to accelerate, like no permits for passenger L5 vehicles, which is under implementation at many states. That will really help. Uh, promoting electric vehicles for waste collection at the municipal corporation level will really help. So more vehicles will come on the road and more customers will become familiar with it. And that will further enhance the momentum. Because as far as TCO goes, or even with pa cost parity goes, I think the parity has already arrived. So just getting more people to buy and experience and create that initial demand through interventions like, as I said, waste management vehicles, uh, waiving the permits, to get more vehicles on the road. I think it will just further accelerate. Coming to two-wheelers, um, it's a sector which I'm very excited about. Uh, with the current FAME policy, I can tell you honestly that there is already complete price parity between electric scooters and ice scooters. Um, let's say an ice scooter today costs around 85 to 90,000 rupees to the customer. There are electric scooters starting from 65,000 now, which are in the mid-speed category, and all the way up to, let's say, one, one, one lakh rupees in the high-speed category with equivalent performance. So you are at, already at price parity. Just by paying a little bit more, or even by paying a little, best, little bit less, you can buy an electric scooter, and then you're saving 100 rupees a day, assuming that you're using one liter of petrol a day. So people have accepted that they're going to save money on electric scooters. India has a very large market of two-wheelers. We have second largest market in the world. It's a huge opportunity. Uh, I believe that over the next 10 years, around 40 to 50 percent two-wheelers in our country will be electric, starting with scooters, which will lead the charge, mopeds, and then finally motorcycles. It's a very big opportunity because crow, that means crows of vehicles. And um, I think what is required, it, even this year, for example, the markets have doubled from uh, around, uh, we are around 3 to 4 lakh, 5 lakh vehicles now and expected that we'll sell around 12 lakh vehicles in the coming year. So the numbers are going up. Uh, what's required is again infrastructure now uh, in terms of charging infrastructure, you know, also uh, better products, better technology, uh, getting out of the Chinese imported vehicles which are there in the market still. So policy should de-emphasize that and promote good quality vehicles. But I'm very bullish that there is no reason why a very aggressive electrification of two-wheelers will not happen. And there is good amount of uh, government support. There's good amount of clarity of strategy. I think it's a time for implementation, uh, creating the supply chain, and uh, implementing the charging infrastructure, and getting good safety standards in place, so that all uh, things like battery swapping, so that you know customers can be benefited. So very large numbers of electric two-wheelers can be expected. Thank, Thank you, you Suraja. That's, again, very encouraging. We talked about... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we talked about, we heard about the demand side of it. We heard about the supply side of it. We all understand the policies 
can help or harm the policies of the government. So let's move to the policies front. To some extent, some of you talked about it, Sula you mentioned some of those policy aspects. Uh, the specific question is, what policies of the government, especially Maharashtra government, uh, how are they helping? Also the question is, to be fair, what could be done even more to further help in, in, in the spirit of continuous improvement, right? So both aspects very uh, keen to understand from the supply side, the manufacturing side, as well as from the demand side. Uh, so if there is any commentary from any one of you, we could start with you, Girish, and then if anyone has any commentary on this. Right, Prashant, and uh, even on the government policy framework and support, I'll start from the demand side. I think all of us know about the fame, phase one, phase two incentives. Uh, I must add here that, uh, you know, some of the state governments and especially Maharashtra state has taken the lead in coming up with a very, very innovative model, uh, which is own and operate. I mean, it is called as gross cost contract model. And it's a win, win, win model. So it's a win for the end customer. It is a win for the state transport undertaking. And it's also a win for the OEM on a longer term. They can also hope to make money. And I'm sorry, could you explain this? I haven't understood. Yeah, you. see, so today, I think the customers are not necessarily so happy with the kind of uh, transportation that they have with the kind of electric buses that are being made available, right? Especially the air-conditioned ones. I think the consumers are extremely happy because it has better NVH and better comfort. And this is a model which actually started by the Honorable Minister in, in Mumbai. And I must say that, you know, all cities in Maharashtra and for that matter, the country should actually take lead from this and take this model forward. And in fact, looking at the success of this model in Mumbai, CSL, which is you know part of Niti Aayog, they have decided to aggregate the demand for five more cities at the national level. So this is something which has been a, a big booster, I would say, for penetration in the electric buses. I think on the on the supply side, I must say that the auto PLI, auto component PLI and battery PLI is, is a is a big booster from the central government, and there are 18 auto automotive OEMs. 75 auto component players and four battery players who have decided to get into it. That's going to be a big investment and I'm sure I think the states will also come up with their respective incentives to pull a lot of this investment in their, in their states. In, in addition to this, I must say that I think specific to different states, there are a few incentives which are also available on the local taxes, etc., which is also making a lot of sense. I think looking ahead, what could help to accelerate the pace of penetration of EVs? I would say it, it will be very, very important to continue this support till the penetration or the population on the road crosses a particular threshold. In some of the other countries like China, we have seen if the incentives are pulled out, pulled back earlier, I think the demand suddenly crashed. So this is something I'm sure the government is aware of and we will look into. And I think there are a few small, small things which need to be done. For example, uh, you know, we believe that when, say, car EV penetration, if it crosses 15%, the connected load will increase, and then the entire distribution uh, infrastructure that we have will have to be upgraded, so that that much of connected load can be handled. Uh, the second thing is, I mean, it's a very small thing. For example, most of the companies, I mean, all companies who are profitable spend 2.5% of their profit on CSR activities. If we allow all the activities towards electrification and sustainability to be part of that, I think it will make a lot of difference. Many corporates will go for employee transportation towards electrification, right? And, uh, you know, there are few other things which, which can be done, which can actually accelerate the journey. I must say that, uh, you know, the Honorable Minister is here. He is having a very bold vision. You know, I had a chance to interact with him yesterday and I was absolutely delighted with the kind of bold vision he has. And I'm very optimistic, therefore, that you will have more cities like Mumbai, which will start shifting their public transportation into electrification. And as we improve the technology, we improve the range. Today it is limited to intracity, but I'm sure one day we will also be able to get into intercity. Just one point I would like to make, I think, uh, the journey towards electrification in India is going to happen through gaseous fuels. The, the reason is, of course, you know, energy security and import substitution, and of course, emission control. But our country does need 
uh, import substitution because of the over dependence on the fuel which is being imported, energy being imported. And I think therefore in the long term, the government is pushing for flex fuel, which is ethanol in petrol, and is also, being, uh, is also pushing biogas uh, as a part of uh, either diesel petrol, right? So this is also something which will actually accelerate the movement towards alternate fuel and then finally going towards electrification. So I think a lot of things are being put in place. The government has been pushing this a lot. And OEMs, from our side, I think we are fully committed to make this drive very, very successful. Thank you so much. This is great too. <laughs> Trust me, there is no better sound than this one. So uh, the claps. I think it's great to hear from the industry leader about some of the success stories of the uh, existing policies, extant policies that we have, which could be taken forward. It's also good to hear the guidance about the kind of care that the uh, electric, electricity distribution network needs to, to, to kind of take care of, right? Uh, looking in a near future, medium term future. Thank you for that. Any other views from any one of you about the, how policies are helping and the areas of improvement, both sides of it? Thank you. And at the end of it, then we'll have the CEO commenting on it and we'll conclude because it's four. 40 is 4 minutes, 40 seconds is what we got. Thank you. Okay. I'll try to take it short. Okay. Um, basically, I share my experience. Uh, I'm in India since uh, five years now as managing director of Piaggio. And I have to say that uh, I've been definitely impressed by the level of push that uh, India in general as a country, as government, as a nation is giving to electrification of mobility. It's something that is really a unique case. Uh, I'm working for a group that is into electrification of mobility since more than 20 years. But honestly, we have never been able, uh, all across the world, to break the barriers of, uh, that still are there, the mindset of a consumer to adopt this kind of, uh, this kind of solution alternative to, to IC. And I think that uh, the most fertile ground that is exists in a global base for uh, speed up electrification at a larger scale is really India due to the existence of policies, and I have to congratulate Honorable Minister Aditya Ji for the uh, very effective Marastra state policy that is definitely at the forefront, not only in India, but also at the global base. I think it's also setting a benchmark uh, globally also for other countries that want to follow exactly the same kind of, of path. Say that, I think that, my opinion is that definitely policies are very helpful in the short midterm but cannot give sustainability to the business itself in the long term. So, because policy and incentives, subsidies cannot last forever. Sooner or later we had to end and we had to be uh, accompanied by a parallel development of supply chain that is meant to increase the capacity and know-how at the local level in India, but also in terms of reduction of cost to make finally really the cost of industrialization of electric vehicles uh, at any extent competitive uh, and comparable with the cost of production of an IC vehicle. It is not a mystery that uh, in two-wheeler high-speed uh, segment uh, got a boost in terms of demand uh, in the term of plus per 10 uh, when incentive fain two were increased from 10,000 to 15,000 kilowatt hour per battery. At that point in time there was an explosion of demand of two-wheeler electric. That means that, uh, in the, as I said, in short term, uh, subsidies are helping, but they are not enough. If we want to maintain uh, the sustainability of a business in the long term, uh, we have to work uh, on ground uh, to create the ecosystem that is infrastructure, that is supply chain, that is serviceability, because it is also true that uh, the, the, the customer experience doesn't end uh, when uh, you have bought the vehicle, when you have to get full service and you have to have full preparedness of a network to service also this kind of solution. So we had to work uh, as OEM along with component supplier with government to create this ecosystem to give really sustenance in the long term. Thank you so much. Many, many thanks. Appreciate the fact that, you know, we need to work together. The, the industry and government needs to work together. Uh, Mr. Balbi Singh, if you have any comment thereafter, a quick one, then the CEO MIDC would uh, give his response or his commentary, and then we'll come towards conclusion. So very quick ones. Uh, two things that are working very well for us in our segment is, one is 5% GST, really helping keeping the cost of the car low. Second is zero registration tax, thanks to the government of Maharashtra, which 
you know, in a normal car is 10 to 20 percent. That's huge cost, which is zero. Uh, two things which would I would say wish list. One is most of the cars are still intercity. You know, the customers are avoiding to take them uh, intra, uh, sorry, intercity. So if there are high speed charges, not just charges, we need high speed charges on the roads and some national highways have been perceived to be going in that direction. I think that will really help. And uh, this, is, this is going to give a big boost to the customers so that they are not scared of taking the cars outside. So I think these are uh, the topics and one tiny little topic but it makes a lot of difference. Let's say if all of our societies in Mumbai, Maharashtra, Pune, they have one charger that itself motivates people to buy electric cars. So I think these kind of things are small but they really make a huge difference. So these two uh, requests I can have from my side. Thank you so much. Uh, a one-liner from you, Sulajya, and then I'll go to uh, Dr. Anbalgan. Very quickly, I'd like to say that um, normally, you know, when you ask industry what support you want from the government, they always have a long laundry list and a list of complaints. I think in case of EV, we can proudly say that our government, even at the center and definitely at the state, have come up with very favorable policies. And this, you know, there is not much to complain. And I have to scratch my brain when somebody asks me, what do you want now? What, you know, change you want in the policies? That's very good. I think the time has come now for us to work together um, and to implement the policy um, and time for demand creation and ecosystem creation. Um, and, you know, along the way, we will find some areas which need some tweaking, some additional support, some modifications for which we need a champion. And we are very proud in our state. We have Aditya Ji as a champion who's always willing to listen and uh, help. So I think we need now this kind of a push, champion for uh, electrification and working together to create demand. Because in India, what is happening in India, the more you sell, it will create more word of mouth and more demand and that will further help the cause. So I'd like to thank the government and all of you for all this and uh, wish everybody all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sulajja. Uh, with permission from all of you and Honorable Minister, we'll extend the session by three minutes if that's okay. We'll request uh, Dr. Anbalgan, the CEO of MIDC, uh, to comment on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prasad. To sum up, I think I'll also like reply uh, some of the queries. but. To begin with, I would say the policy which everyone looks at is maybe one of the best policy as of now available. Only to quote an example, to invest, to get a mega project status in Chakan or Pune, you are supposed to invest around 1500 crore. But that has been reduced by 15x, 15x. You just invest 100 crore and you get mega project status. And though the policy also has an ultra mega project status for uh, 1500 crore, but absolutely that becomes redundant because D plus you get everything where which are otherwise also ultra mega project gets it. So this is one thing which policy takes, up, uh, takes care of it. So secondly, to also support that MIDC is also parallelly working the land allotment process, the single window clearance process because it allots land despite we are not looking at any, even people coming with 2 crores, 3 crores, the land has been allotted on priority. There is no queue at all. And secondly, like typically on the lines of an electronic manufacturing cluster on Ranjangao, MID is also going to set up a full-fledged AV vendor park in Talegao, maybe minimum to begin with 250 acres. So you come, ju just come there and pick it. And see if, if you have like uh, Pagio gas or maybe Audi gas or maybe Tata gas, Mahindra gas or even Hero, what I has, if you have your vendors, your captive vendors or maybe vendors are across the board, they all will be given land on, if they demand, the work set also will be built and they, it's not on a like a long term lease, they can be a short term rentals for 5 years, 10 years, over a period of time they can own the property. So there is literally no initial cost when you are like converting an IC guy to an electric guy, you may need to put up some investment. So the government takes care of your building and whatever like support in fact. This is one thing which we are looking at and soon we are going to start that even with Talega uh, phase four. Second. Third, uh, particularly the component of like uh, typically the bulk, uh, I would say the production which are going to happen for a two wheelers and maybe three wheelers. So the state is also looking at maybe a policy change for particularly in a segment like Audi, even the public transport buses and maybe the cars where just not only the incentivization, for example, if I am buying to car, going to have a car of 40 lakhs, I don't, I'm not going to look at like, so there are like other non-fiscal and procedural things which the government is also looking at and we got an input from like yesterday's deliberations that surely the government is also looking into that. With uh, having uh, said all that, 
you have you have a, like close to the state has a i would say an ambitious target of like charging infra close to almost 2500 covering almost initially to begin with the seven cities and of course it can be extended to all the like 26 28 cities and all the major four ways like the prosperity, prosperity corridor nagpur to mumbai and of course our expressway uh, mumbai pune and of course other major uh, ways are all going to have a full fledged thing so we can also look at stage carriers uh, passenger buses, MSRT buses, so that is what like, we are looking at. And state itself is going to be the biggest con consumer to begin with. So to give a push in the beginning and with almost close to more than 25 percent of the capacity for an auto production and with an all the support ecosystem, I think state is, state is going to gain and even with uh, PLI scheme and of course for the both for the OEM and also for the ancillary, I think close to around 70 or 80 companies are given for an ancillary and of course 8 or 9 for a OEM. And of course, we have all the way with, with us. So even like they have to like, um, uh, I would say retrofit their plans, absolutely so going into a new place, starting afresh will not make any sense. Even if I am a guy to put up a plan, so absolutely it's going to be that any add-on investment in the existing plant is also taken care of that. So even if, you, if I have like a 1,500 investment, I invest another 100 crore. So again, I get a mega project state for that typical 100 crore or 200 crore. So absolutely the policy is so flexible and I think we should uh, go ahead with that. Parallel to begin with, because charging is going to be one thing and also you need an electricity for that, the state also offers an like solar path. So the MADC is in the process of aggregating close to around 10,000 acres which can support to begin with at least 3,000 megawatt. So we just uh, give on a short term rental or long term rental to set up a solar path. So any like OEM or maybe any anyone who is going to put up a charging infra also can own their uh, own power distribution network. So that way I think the, all, the, uh, I would say all the entire value chain has been captured. I think uh, we should be able to, I think the state should do a very good in this particular sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anbalgan. I think uh, this is so inspiring and encouraging. I must mention as this is the most authoritative view from the industry that you can get in India. Uh, you know the organizations that each one of these leaders represent and also their views that matter even beyond their company in the industry. It's also very interesting, the Honorable Minister who is here in the audience and that's not very often that you would have a minister in the audience on what's happening and that shows the importance that the government is putting on the alternate fuel vehicle uh, ecosystem. It's not often that the principal secretary decides that this is the alternate fuel vehicle uh, conclave and hence I will come in an EV. And she organizes an EV to make sure that she travels from Mumbai to Pune in EV. It's not very often that this, the CEO of an industrial development corporation comes over and says, I'm sitting here for four days, tell me any investor who would want to do anything, any problems that are there we would want to solve sitting here, and six hours is all that we would need to show the place that they could go and start their operations. I think this is very, very encouraging environment. Now, of course, we are industry. As, in, as bit of inflation is good, bit of our complaining is not bad. We would continue to come, we would continue to make suggestions, requests, uh, appeals, representations. But also, we would take note of the fact that there is a great amount of support and enabling environment that's being provided by the government. We would want to thank you all for doing that and we look forward to even better progress of alternate fuel vehicles uh, in Maharashtra. Thank you so much. Now I'll hand it over to Gitanjali to conclude this session so that we can move forward.